Welcome to the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. To stop him, you must lead a team like nothing the world has seen. Our transportation has arrived. You have four days. We're laying out a feast for you at the Sizzler. First, tender, tasty Gulf Rock Shrimp, like miniature lobster tails. It's more good things to eat than you can shake a stick at. And here's the stick, Sizzler's new speared steak. And now, Minsky's world-famous burlesque presents the incomparable Miss Gypsy Rose Lee in our salute to the Garden of Eden. Today, a lot of banks are giving lots of reasons for not giving business loans. But at Lloyd's Bank of California, instead of giving excuses, we're giving loans. Because at Lloyd's Bank of California, we know who we work for. Don't want moochers taking your new longer-lasting juicy fruit? The fur will fly when you get the longer-lasting juicy fruit attack kitten. Watch. Juicy fruit's flavor is longer-lasting? Give me some. Come on, give me some. Give me some. Give me some. Whoa, denied. Kitten sold separately. If you watch a lot of TV and movies, you've probably heard this man's voice. He has one of the most recognizable voices in entertainment. He has worked on films like The Mummy, Land of the Lost, Happy Feet 2, Garfield, Star Trek, Babe, The Lion King, Leo Stitch. He's a dear friend of mine. Damon Crawl. Damon Crawl. Hey, David. How are you? It's good to see you. Oh, you too. You too, Damon. Even if it's just electronically. <laughs> I know. This is living in the twilight zone for sure. Oh my God, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I just, uh, you said that I looked over there and I have this baked potato on my bed. So <laughs> <laughs> when you said the twilight zone, I said, what's next? No. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, I've known you, I don't even know. I don't remember exactly. Oh, I think I do. Did we meet in a workshop together? Yes. Gary, what's his, what's... Oh, what right, Gary, Gary Dubin? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I remember that now. I remember mm -hmm. that. It's interesting how you, like, you meet people and you're with them for the rest of your life as friends. And you... Right, right. Well, we just hit it off. I don't know. Yeah. Birds of a feather. Yeah. And there I got, you go. I got a few feathers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to where they are. Um, when did you first know you wanted to be an actor and a voice actor? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, I wanted to be an actor. Uh, voice acting came much, much later after college in those days. Um, I guess it was in high school where I had the first opportunities to do that kind of stuff. And it was fun and I liked it. And I remember we were in a, I lived in Ventura at the time. And we were in the Southern California, um, I don't know, some kind of competition, high school plays. And we came down here to Providence High School by the hospital. Right. And we did our play and everybody did their plays. And I won the Best Actor Award. So I thought, oh, maybe this is something I could do. So yeah, I, I majored in theater and went on from there. Wow. Now, but I, the voiceover thing uh, happened when I came out here. My dear friend from college uh, was starting a group to mm -hmm. do voiceover, to do ADR looping, as you've heard it talked about. And she said, I think you'd be very good at this. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So she said, come on in. So I went over to Paramount Studios, which for me was a big thrill in those days. I'd never been on a studio a lot unless I was on the Universal tour yeah. and so I drove over and I did a film called Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen. Oh yeah yeah who was in that was that? Peter Ustinov played Charlie Chan to a huge outcry and 
rightly so, from the Asian actors in town, but they were casting again a Caucasian in that role. Right. Uh, Angie Dickinson was in it. She was the first movie star I think I met when I was working because I walked onto the stage and she was sitting there combing that beautiful blonde hair. And this was a long time ago. Right, right. That's so, so interesting that you said about the, you know, at that time, and, and now we're moving on to, quote, the disability community. Yes. Where, where now it's, we're breaking through to finally have actors with disabilities, you know, work more in that. Of course, respect. and they're so qualified. Why wouldn't they? It's like everything else in this town. Yeah. But breaking through is good. Breaking through is the start, and um, it's fun to see some of the people that I've met through you, uh, see them on television and yeah. in the movies. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about uh, being, you know, acting on stage and growing up in Ventura. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know, no buts, and I know that you go back to back to the mountains to do shows. Right. I, I went to a junior college in Ventura, and one of my acting instructors there uh, was connected to the Black Hills Playhouse in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And uh, I think back in 1971, he said, I think a summer out here would be good for you. And so, you know, I was 19 years old. I asked my parents if I could go because I'd have to drive my car back there. And they said, sure, go ahead. They were very trusting. And so off I went to do summer stock theater in the Black Hills. And I stayed there until 1993, I believe it was. You, I, you mean every I, summer? Every summer, except for there were a few in-betweens that I couldn't go because I was trying to get my career started out here. I think about seven years I didn't go. Uh, but yes, I spent a lot of my summers out there. It was my second home. How fun. So that was really wonderful training, too, because you were performing a show at night and rehearsing a show in the daytime. And then once once you had your run of the other show, you put the next show up. Right. Right. So it was all very fast. But and, good training. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after college, I came back out here with the full intention of, you know, trying to get some acting roles. And um, I got an agent pretty quickly, and they were sending me out. And then I also started getting these um, looping jobs. And at first, they were kind of slow, you know, maybe one or two a month. And all of a sudden, I was up to like three or four a week. And so my agents would call me and say, we'd like you to go on a call. And I'd say, I can't. I'm already working. Well, you know, agents don't like to hear that. Um, so I lost every agent I had pretty much that way, except for my commercial agent, who I still have. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I went for it and, and made my career as a, as a looper. You know, there's so many different things in the voiceover world. People yeah. will come to me and say, I've decided I want to do voiceovers. And I go, okay, what do you want to do? Yeah. And they're not quite sure then because it, it, is, it is a field with multiple possibilities. Of course, animation is the first one that comes to mind mm -hmm. uh, and probably one of the most fun, as you and I know. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, then there's commercial voiceover, which is what we hear on television and, um, and radio, the, the narrator of the commercial that we're watching, that you don't see him, you just hear him do the pitch for the product. And that's commercial voiceover. Then what, and you always have a script, of course, when you go in to do that. What I do and did for 37 years was go in and look at film on a screen and decide, and decide what kind of voices we needed uh, throughout that scene because the extras never talk on the set. It would be too disconcerting to have all those voices going. If you have a room full of 30 people, uh, out to dinner, so to speak, and two actors that you're trying to get main dialogue on, you couldn't have those people talking. So they're sitting in the background, moving their mouths and acting like they're having a great time. And so we, as actors, would stand there and look at them, decide what they were saying, and improvise the whole thing, totally off the top of our heads. Well, that's interesting. I wanted to bring up somebody, um, I put this on Facebook, 
that you were going to be on today. And Eric Sean Wolf said something in regards to that. Is it like in the movies when you're doing a voiceover where you get to see everything on the screen while you are adding your inflections and twists to the characters like the mummy or do they animate based off your interpretation of the character? That can be an animation. They would do that. They would let me record first and then animate to me afterwards. Um, no. Uh, well, there's also the, the voiceover part, the ADR, where you go in and do yourself on the screen. In Garfield, I was the dog show announcer. I was on camera. And so I had to go back in and redo my, my voice. Right. And so, yes, you could re, redo your performance. But a lot of times, um, and this was especially true back in the older days of television, 80s and early 90s, they would go on location to a place, say they'd go to Atlanta, Georgia, and they'd shoot a segment, and they'd come home, and they would have hired an actor there for an under five, and, you know, here he'd be a great big burly guy, I've had a voice up here like this, <laughs> which is, you know, not uncommon, it's the way people are, and that's not what they wanted. So they would come back here, hire someone like me with a deeper voice, and I would go in and redo his performance. Uh, oh, wow. Well, that's another way of doing uh, ADR and looping, is right. replacing dialogue. ADR means automated dialogue replacement. Now, is that same like with My Fair Lady when they had somebody else sing the songs for Audrey Hepburn? Uh, no. When they had uh, Marnie Nixon sing those songs, she pre-recorded all of that stuff. Okay. And then on the sets, course she would get the play uh, Audrey would get the playback and mimic or sing right along with Marnie probably singing out loud to get the look and feel of really singing right right so, yeah I mean on when they're shooting a musical they have to pre-record all of that of stuff course. and then they go back and re-record it again to have perfect control and get exactly the performance they want yeah the yeah. film the picture might add some subtle nuance that, that wasn't in the original pre-record, and so they want to put that in now. And so they'll go back and re-record the song. One of the, um, one of the films that I'm most proud of is Hyde. So, um, have you, uh, I don't know, been with anyone before? Sure. I mean, not like this over the internet, but when I was young in school, after I'd been with someone, I decided to tell my mother. So I looked her straight in the eye, and I said, there's something you should know about me. How did she uh, take it? She said very cautiously, that's not right. You're not supposed to do that. Please don't ever do that again. And I remember the look on her face, and I knew right then that I had to hide everything thoughts, my questions. When I met my wife, I told myself, you're going to learn to love her. And did you? Yes. Uh, you and I did uh, together. And I remember that time afterwards, it was the first time in this big room that I guess ADR, that's what I was. Uh, that's what was, you were doing for your I was, character. I was uh, in, uh, filling in the gaps that weren't clear enough. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, but what a great experience that was. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to do yourself. It's an interesting thing because um, it's really, when you're replacing someone else's dialogue, um, it all of a sudden becomes a very musical thing. And a lot of people don't have the chops to do it. And that's just some actors can and some actors can't. Uh, but if you have kind of a musical background and you start hearing rhythms and, and things like that, you can go on and do it and do it very quickly and it comes out okay. Is it when you're when you're uh, voicing someone else? Do you? It's the rhythm of 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 their energy as well as the 
the emotionality of what they're going yes, to do. Absolutely. And then the director may say to you, I don't want that emotion, put this emotion in, which is kind of tough because you're hearing him yeah. in your ear yeah. doing one thing and you've got to be in sync with him, but you're going to do something else now. You're going to change the inflections or do something else. Um, and it can be very difficult. Mm. But lots of fun. I, I always loved it. Yeah, I could see. I could see. It's like, it could be difficult, but I love it. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. And sometimes, you know, I would stand up to do a character, and I just couldn't get it to save my soul. I just couldn't get it. And someone else, and this is where it's, you don't have your ego on your sleeve. Right. This is not, this kind of work is not about your ego. And so someone else would get up and do it and hit it just right off the mark. And, you know, that happens. Yeah. That happens a lot of times. So. And it, and it happens, everybody, sometimes it might happen to you, but then sometimes you might jump in for someone else. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then the improv stuff, we would do a lot of research about what we were going to be doing. Um, so, I, for example, I, I had, they called me and said, you're going to be doing the voice of a surgeon doing open heart surgery. Oh, wow. So I had to call people and, and find out. I have a few doctor friends and call them and just get some general knowledge of, and this was well before the internet. We didn't have any of this kind of research yeah. um, to find out what kind of things would they be saying. And my favorite was one doctor said, well, usually while they're working, they'd be talking about their golf game or what they did over the weekend. Um, unless it's an emergency situation, then of course they would be really concentrating on what they need, um, interspersed with a few uh, commands to other people. And so that's what I ended up doing. And it came up sounding so natural and so real. And, but the, the fun part about that is I didn't have to sing to him because he had a mask on. Oh, God. But <laughs> another one that was interesting was, um, what was that, by the way? What was that? Oh, gosh, I don't remember the name of that film. That could have been a television show, even. Right. It could have been like Remington Steel or, or something like that, which we did the whole series of. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Barry Bostwick did a three-part uh, miniseries. Uh, he played George Washington. Okay. Yeah. And there was a scene where they wanted Barry to be walking up to Independence Hall up that long sidewalk, yeah. and the windows of Independence Hall are open where Congress, Second Congressional Congress is meeting, and they wanted him to hear during this long walk a, a kind of a tirade by one congressman going on and on and on and on about the situation that they were facing. And so they said, Damon, you do that. And it was like, I'm going to improvise for two minutes what they would say in the, in the Continental Congress. <laughs> and for somehow the grace of God went into my head and I started in on the tea taxes and all the representation or, you know, taxation without representation. I just started letting it fly out. And it was like, whew. They got done, and they, they, people stood up and clapped because it was ridiculous. But then I, they said, would you do it again? And I said, absolutely not. I couldn't <laughs> do that again. <laughs> and they used it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. The wow. Thing I used to love doing was, uh, I don't know if you remember a television show called Falcon Crest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Towards the last few seasons, uh, of course, these very, very rich people had racehorses. So they were at the racetrack at Santa Anita a lot. And they needed a racetrack announcer. Oh. Well, my father was kind of a gambler. And back in the day when I was little, he would take me to the racetrack with him. And I would hear those racetrack announcers. And so I would write it all out and get up there and do those racetrack announcements. And I just loved it. It was so much fun. When you said the racetrack, I was like, and they wanted me to do a horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Yes. <laughs> Actually, that happened in the movie Babe. Oh. A friend of mine did the horse. Oh. And. Uh, now, who did you do in Babe again? I did Rex the dog. Um, the, the reason they were doing ADR on all of this stuff was yeah. because it was uh, shot in Australia. Mm -hmm. Most of the actors were Australian and they had very heavy accents. And I don't remember what Warner Brothers or some Paramount was afraid that uh, the American audiences would not understand them. Right. So okay. they gave me that part and I can't remember who played it now, but they, it, it was a kind of a famous actor. Yeah. They, they took it back to Australia and let him redo it. Um, but all the growls and the snaps and all of that other stuff is me doing it. Oh, that's amazing. So we kind of did it together in tandem. Yeah. Did you ever meet him in person? No, no, because he was in Australia. Yeah. Time to take a trip. Well, I not to say it was Guy Ritchie, but I can't remember now. Yeah. Could have been Guy Ritchie. Um, but it was, you know, a long time ago. Right. And they auditioned a lot of people here uh, to do the part. And I happened to be running the sessions for our our um, casting person. And <laughs> the director finally said to me, you do it. Let me hear you do it. So I did it. And he said, you're cast. You're doing it. <laughs> that's like, well, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy. Cast myself, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. But, uh, what was, what was one of your favorite, I mean, it's so hard to choose. I, I, you know, sometimes they just go, I know that, well, I mean, it's certain, cer a certain memory. It doesn't have to be your favorite, but a memory of a film or a, or a show that you were going, ah, that just keeps, you know, circulating in my mind is one of. One yeah, of I don't know if it keeps circulating, but one of the most uh, interesting things, and it was really early on in my career, it had to have been, you know, in the first year I was working, we were to do a movie called Annie, the one with Carol Burnett. Yeah. Um, and so we went in and they asked, I don't know, it was 8.30 in the morning, they asked right. all the guys to get up and cock-a-doodle-doo like a rooster. <laughs> and, you know, of course, we looked at each other and thought, this is pretty crazy. And so we did it. And the director, uh, Walter Houston, John, I mean, John Houston, uh, said, you do that. And then he left. He didn't stay. And I had no idea what I was doing. But what, was, what happened is um, Rooster Hannigan is Miss Hannigan's brother that comes in. And he, he couldn't cock a doodle do. He could do all the singing and dancing and all the other fun stuff, but he couldn't cock-a-doodle-do like a rooster. So every time he had to do that, he would put his hands, you know, do the, the whole thing, but my voice would come out of his face. Ah, I gotta watch that again. Yep. Oh my God. You know, I was, what? Fun stuff. It, fun stuff. I, I, was, I remembered something that you had said a couple of questions ago, and it's really about, well, when you were, had to improvise for two minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a detailed, you know, back in the whatever age. So it's really important to have schooling across the board. Some people say, I want to be an actor and I'm going to be, a, you know, but history and math and Spanish. And, and That's one of, my, one of my things that I tell young actors, start being observant. And that goes for school too. Everything you're learning in school, you may be able to turn around and use it to your benefit as an actor. Because mm -hmm. who knows what you're going to do in your career? You could play from one end of the field to the other. And all of that will help. And even if you don't remember it, you at least know where you can go find it. Right. And just to have that embedded in you, the, the levels of history. and mm -hmm. um, you know. I always found it very important. That yeah. was, you know, the one thing that, and just be observant. Everything that's happening around you, you never know when that's going to turn around and go, oh, wow, I remember seeing that. It was a fight somewhere, and I just watched it. Right, right, right. Odd things. Watch people. 
Right? Watch people learn from everybody. That's what um, you're going to be doing, creating those characters. Well, I have to say two of my favorite um, pieces that I've worked on, um, uh, projects, were done, both of them were with you. One was Hyde, mm -hmm. and the other one was um, Heavenly Peace. I know. I love that. That's still one of my favorites. You too. Yeah. Oh, I just, well, here is my. Oh. Yeah. What do you call that? Mouse pad? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I just, I wish he would do some more for us. I know, right? Yeah, you know, I know. I he's was, so busy. Oh, he's busy. He's busy. Uh, Andreas is amazing. He, and I was talking to um, Minerva uh, the other day, and she was talking about this for the first story that she ever wrote. And it was about balloon people. Mm. And I was going, wait a minute. But, I mean, that's an amazing short story that you can have these different faces and these balloons talking to each other. I said, Andreas. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's your next short. Exactly. Sure. Oh, I wish he would do something. That would be he's he's so talented and he's fun to work with. Yeah. Yeah. And you're fun to work with. Oh, I love working with you. What what color balloon would you want to be? Blue. What what shade? Because I want blue too. <laughs> okay, then I'll do red. I'm not I'm No, 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 no. You could you could I, do you could do royal blue. I'll do the light blue. Oh, that's Baby blue. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I really, yeah, that heavenly piece was, I still, every, now I could say I have a Christmas movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's a good one. Yeah, it really is. It's really it. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, is it on YouTube? It is on YouTube. Yeah. Good. It's on YouTube, so you could you see it there. Um, and then, of course, there was the famous uh, where I worked on Prince of Tides. <gasps> uh, tell us about working on the Prince of Tides with, with Barbara. Yes. She was the director. No. And she was there. And it was very interesting because there were a cohort of people just around her doing stuff all the time, um, like assistance and whatever. And we were told we were not to call her Barbara, we were to call her Miss Streisand, and that uh, we shouldn't look her directly in the eye when we talk to her. <laughs> and what else? That we shouldn't talk unless spoken to. Wow. So, um, I was sitting there and we started working on the film and I thought, gee, from what they've told us, that's not her. She's very outgoing, very wonderful, very friendly, very appreciative. I mean, you could get up and fall on your face and she'd stand up and clap for you. <laughs> it's just really, really wonderful. Yeah. Um, I don't, if you remember the movie, there's a really uh, horrible scene where the children are raped. Uh, and there was this big lumbering guy that was one of the rapists that she wanted me to do the efforts and the voiceovers for. And she cleared the room. She said, this is going to be very difficult work. And uh, Damon will be, I'll work with Damon alone. And so they cleared the room. And there I stood with Barbara Streisand <laughs> thinking, okay, you're not supposed to speak, but... It was a little awkward. Yeah. And so I said, well, um, I'm happy to be here, but I was a little afraid to work with you today. And she said, oh, why was that? I said, well, I read the Inquirer. I know. And she looked at me and I thought she's going to hit me. But she started laughing. And then she went, yeah, if I was a man directing, I'm a genius. If I'm a woman directing, I'm a bitch. Uh, I said, no, but you're not. You're a fabulous director. She said, thank you very much. And she put her arm around me and walked me up to the microphone and said, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's interesting now, all these movies that you have been in, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I listed a few, but you've been uh, done The Simpsons and South Park and, and so many movies and, and, and The Prince of Tides, I've got to get my Prince of Tides out now and, and listen again, you know, mm -hmm. listen and watch and because you do voice acting and, and you're in front of the camera behind. Um, we have, we have three students from Performing Arts Studio West joining us. Oh, cool. Uh, and they will be having um, some questions to, to ask uh, and to, um, to visit with us. Uh, let's see. Oh, I was going to tell you one more thing that can come back out of the past when you're doing the kind of work I was doing. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was working on Amadeus, the, the <gasps> film. Oh, yeah. And it came to the point where there's that scene where they're burying Mozart. Right. And there's a lot of music and it's a big huzzerai. But the, the, the ADR director said, uh, we need to have someone do this priest. Right. Who could do that? And I said, well, back then the priest would not be speaking anything but Latin if he was doing a service. Right. Like that. And he does. He has his book open and he's doing the ritual of burial. And the guy said, who could do that? Well, I was an altar boy when I was a little kid. And when I was in second grade, I had to learn all that Latin I wrote. I had no idea what it meant, but because the, the mass in those days was all in Latin. And so I had all those Latin prayers still in my head that I could do. And if you listen to it very carefully, you can hear faintly my Latin underneath all of the extreme music that's going on. And uh, it's, it's really funny. Oh my God. I've got, I, when we get out of uh, quarantine, I want to come over to your house and we can watch some of your clips. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we've got what, some wonderful uh, uh, people here, wonderful Great. actors and actors. Oh, great, great. Matthew Selden. Uh, Austin Vance, Raquel Chavez, and um, uh, Matthew and Austin also are animators. Yes. Whoa! Oh yeah. Um, so uh, let's we could we could start with Matthew. Do you have a, a question for Damon? Uh, oh yeah, uh, Damon. Hi. Do, do you know I'm an animator? Does I make cartoons called Evolution Land? That's on YouTube. Oh, cool. That's great. And um, do you, you, are you working on any projects now, Matthew? Yeah, yeah right, right now. I, I'm getting close to done. Yeah, the, the, the episode that's called uh, Desk Interviews Define. Got it. Got it. Awesome. So, so it should be up on YouTube tomorrow. Very oh, nice. good. We can look for it. We can look. And did, and did you have a, a another question for uh, Damon uh, about voiceover or being in the business? That that'd be great. So do you might do like a voiceover for one of my Eevee cartoons? You want me to do one? Would you, would you, meaning you would want to hire him to do one? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe like at one point. Sure. That would be my pleasure. That would be an honor. It'd be wonderful. I, I look forward yeah, to awesome. That. Maybe cast me. Job. Job. <laughs> I know. What about me? No, no, Damon's, <laughs> Damon's the magic man. No, no, you're a pretty right. magic too. Oh, no. no, that would be fun, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right, let's do, uh, let's talk to Raquel Chavez. Hello, nice to meet you, Dave. Hi, Raquel. Hi, Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. I nice had a to question. Thank okay. you. I had a question. Do you have done any TV shows and voiceover done, done in the past? TV shows? Yes, yeah, we TV. did a lot of television shows, but most of them aren't running anymore. Uh, that was earlier on in my career. Uh, we did, uh, oh gosh, Remington Steel was one of them. Young Riders, which was a Western. Uh, gosh, I have to think back. All of the Star Trek. 
Mm. Oh, Next Generation, think? Deep Space Nine. Uh, yes, we did those. Was there, in, in, in regards to Star Trek, was there, um, did it, was it all whenever you went to the different um, so-called seasons or, or different um, actually shows, did they shift a little in tone or was it all pretty much the same tone? It depended, and, on, depended on what you were doing because right. within the ships, uh, yes, on the bridge, for example, all of that technical walla, that had to be pretty much the same. Yeah. But then they would land or go to different worlds and that all had to be adjusted for wherever you were. Right, right. Um, and then you- The voices of the Borg. Right. You know, we had, those were processed, of course, but we'd stand there, be maybe several of us doing the voices at the same time. And um, yeah, it, it would just be, we would just do them and do them in a very slow cadence and then they would do something to it and it came out with what you hear in the television show. Right. You really have to have a good ear for this. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I say it's kind of musical. Yeah. You listen. And have you been in a lot of musicals? Um, I directed a lot of musicals in Summerstock, um, but I did a few too. I'm not the greatest singer in the world. Uh, there are other people that have really good trained voices for that. But I'm, uh, if there was a, a character that I could sort of get by with, for example, My Fair Lady was one of my favorites oh. because I could patter uh, Rex Harrison, do like Rex Harrison did. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite characters. Oh, play. I could so see you in that. I did the show four different times, I think. Mm -hmm. I love it. So that um, was lots of fun. Raquel, did you have a second question? Uh, do you with any commercials from the then? Um, well, when I did commercials, I was on camera. They were filming me. Um, and there haven't been too many of those because I never had time to go do them. Um, one of the last ones I did that aired it, and that's got to be, oh, maybe before you were born, <laughs> <laughs> was for Juicy Fruit. <gasps> Um, <laughs> there was one for Carbonite, which was the, the first cloud, you know, where you could store your computer things on the cloud. Um, but yeah, that was fun. That was fun to do them. Thank you. Hi. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Mr. Austin Vance. Hello. Hi. Hi, Austin. How are you? I'm good. Good. How are you? I got a question. All uh, right. What inspired you to work on voiceovers uh, for animated films and shows? What inspired me? Well, as you know, it's a business and someone offered me a job. And that's how that got started. Um, I had no idea. I'd never done anything like that. I'd always been the actor on camera or on stage. And so when they wanted me to just use my voice, I really wasn't quite sure what I was in for. Um, and so I went and did the work and I guess I did okay. They, they kept calling me back for quite a number of years. But it, yeah, it's a, it's a great business to be in uh, doing this because I'll tell you what, uh, Austin, I never wanted to be a big movie star where people would recognize me if I went out on the street. That didn't interest me. But I could work all the time doing voiceover and nobody knew it was me. So I could keep my own anonymity and still have a career. I like to, to listen to old time radio shows from the 1930s and 40s. I thought, what a cool thing. All you had to do was read your lines and but you could act with your voice and not have to worry about your body. And yeah. so I just thought that was very cool. So when I started doing this, I equated it with old time radio programs. And uh, in fact, now I'm the host of a radio program that's been revived called Suspense. Yes. And it's, it's like a podcast. Uh, you can get it on uh, Spotify and some other thing. Apple, I think, carries it too. Um, 
but they're great episodes. I'm not in every episode, but I am the host, the guy that opens and closes it. And then I've done quite a few of the, the shows too. Well, some of those are the most memorable, the host. It's sort of like, you know, the Twilight Zone when he comes on. And you, that's the, the, the thing that first comes to your mind. So that, right. that verse voice that you hear. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and it plays on some radio stations, some internet radio stations, but it plays all over the world, mm -hmm. which is fun. Yeah. Oh, you have one more, Austin? Uh, what is your favorite uh, uh, part for, uh, about working on voiceovers? My favorite part? Um, boy. Well, I think one of my favorite parts that I did was the show I did with David called Heavenly Peace. And that part was really, really fun. We, we both recorded it before... Um, our friend Andreas animated it. And so it was great fun to see all of this stuff come together, but it was a fun part. We knew our characters. Um, it just worked. It, it really, really worked very well. So that was one of my favorites. Yeah. And in fact, Matthew uh, and Austin went to Andreas's home. Oh, cool. and, uh, he, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So, so he's an animator of, of yeah, did the Disney movies like that Disney Tarzan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And does uh, he do Tom and Jerry now, the mouse? I think so. I think that's one of his that he works on. Yeah. I love that too. Yeah, Tarzan, he did the mother, the mother ape. So yes. he's oh, yeah. sent so many. But that was, that was, I have to say that was my favorite too. In fact, I have the well, no, I was going to stand up and get it, but you can imagine me falling over. No, you don't want to do that. I'm going to do it. But it's on the wall, uh, the poster of, uh, of Heavenly Peace. That was, I have to say, one of my top two favorites. That yeah. I and, you know, we recorded it in a garage somewhere. <laughs> you right, that? right next to the pool. We, yeah, we got that. I, I don't know why I knew about it, but that guy would rent his space out really cheap. Yeah. And it was a decent studio. He had it soundproof yeah. and did the recordings and Andreas could work with them and it was fine. Yeah. So well, yeah. you can do a lot with no money. And nowadays, you know, especially in quarantine, I heard this is the time everybody has to have their own studios at home. Well, I'll tell you, I have, I have done some work for Netflix. Netflix is buying a lot of foreign television series and they're bringing them over, and they need to be dubbed in English. Mm. So I have done a few of them, and there was one a few weeks ago in quarantine that they wanted me to do, and they said, um, I said, I don't have a sound booth. And they said, that's okay. We'll send a microphone to you. So a man delivered a microphone, which I hooked to my computer, and I checked it out, and I didn't like the sound of it. So I have a big closet here in my house, and I draped blankets all around the closet, and I moved my, my desktop computer in there, and I recorded everything in my own little sound booth. <laughs> in my own little soundproof closet. <laughs> but it worked. It yeah. worked very well. And uh, they called me and said, you know, we're gonna listen to it. We may need to do pickups in a few days. And I said, okay, whatever, I'm fine. And they called back and said, no, we don't need any pickups. It's all fine. We're going with it. Yeah. So really, really interesting. Yes, I, I just uh, heard from a person uh, from another looping group um, that they're doing it like this. They are, they're Zoom looping. And they're putting all their, their characters together to watch the film in the middle and then start talking. Wow. So where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Yeah. Damon, what is your biggest joy in life? Hmm. I, I, I think doing things for people. I like, I like being able to do things for people. Um, I work for free a lot. But if I find some young person that's getting started, 
and they need me to do something, I like to be able to do that and, and help them. Because people helped me, that's for sure. And giving back, I think, is a great... Other than that, I like to travel, which I can't do now. <laughs> right. I can't go anywhere. Well, so that's okay. Soon, that's, hopefully. Soon, we'll be out of this. Well, thank you, Matthew and Austin and Raquel, for being here. You're uh, welcome. Bringing in You're welcome. questions. Thank you, Matthew and Austin and Raquel. You're and welcome. You're welcome. Damon, thank you, too. thank you, thank you. You're, it's, uh, it is, uh, you know, I use this word, but it's so true. You are a true blessing to have as a friend. Oh, bless your heart, as you are. <laughs> thank you. Come inside, my friend. He knows your future, too. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the dog show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is amazing. Okay, all right. Music, Use it, you idiot. How much is it? Oh, please. Oh, come on, just one big thing. What's the point of spending that much money on non-durable goods? Non-durable goods? Yeah, it won't even last three years. It'll last you decades. <laughs> exactly. It'll outlive me. Bertha is in my employ. You assured me she could be trusted. Fortunately for both of us, I decided to run my own security chain. The money has been wired to your offshore account, Mr. Harris. But if you expect us to continue working together, might I suggest that you screen your partners more carefully? Dispose of them. It says here that you're a, a doctor. Well, yes, of course. My exhibit is entirely educational. Inside this wooden box is a man. Do you know what you want to do with him? Yes, I actually think I understand now. I believe I finally figured out the source of his madness. And I know exactly how we can go about curing him. Memo to George Norton. Regarding written apology. Regarding complaint by Jay Norton. Regarding inappropriate age remark. That's not necessary. Yes. It is, Ms. Norton. I'm looking forward to a good working relationship with you in this company. Now, if you'll excuse me, things are starting to pile up. Gentlemen, we will see you again soon. <laughs>